When the Spirit of the Lord comes upon my heart, I will dance like David danced. When the Spirit of the Lord comes upon my heart, I will dance like David danced. I will dance, I will dance, I will dance like David danced. I will dance, I will dance, I will dance like David Ba 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 
My name is Jan Bender Shetler, and I am a professor of history here and the incoming director of international education. It's been a full and exuberant 24 hours since the conference opened last night. And I'm so grateful to all of you for coming and for everyone, all the voices that have spoken into this process and the engagement of so many people in all of the sessions today. It really felt lovely and productive. It also makes me feel a bit of the weight of responsibility to actually make all these hopes and dreams come true um, and to, to bring into reality a revisioned international education program here. So thank you for all of your commitment to the college, to making our programs better, and for all of you who came and listened and spoke. And if you haven't yet formally spoken into it. Hold on. Um, here <laughs> is the link where you can give us some feedback. Um, so you can get on and do that now, or you can find it at home tonight, or you can go on to the live streaming place and do the link there, or you can go on to our um, the SST uh, 50th anniversary site, and you'll find it there. So give us your feedback. Um, they're, they're our speaker tonight, if you want to speak back into any of that, um, please let us know what you think and anything that you've heard at the conference. After the um, Ron Crable is finished tonight, there'll be a Q&A, and we're going to have people with microphones that will run around and give you a mic. You don't have to come down. Um, so be thinking about. Um, that kind of feedback as well. So stay tuned and stay with us and see what becomes uh, of things in the future in Goshen. And we hope that, um, yeah, we uh, like your support and, and we hope you can stay tuned for what's going to happen in the future. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce Dr. Ron Crable an associate professor from the School of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences at the University of Washington Bothell, and an affiliate faculty with the Center for Communication, Difference, and Equity at the Center for Human Rights at the University of Washington. I knew Ron as a child since our families were close and our fathers worked together, and our mothers were very good friends, and his mother is here tonight. Um, and of course, he's the brother of our own art professor, Meryl Crable. And, doctor, and like Dr. Um, Elaine Meyer Lee, Ron got his start in international education through Goshen College's SST program, this time to China, and also through his family's international connections. Ron is a Goshen College 1990 graduate with a PhD in sociology and historical studies from the New School for Social Research in New York. He has also taught in Australia and South Africa. His scholarly publications are incredibly diverse and fun to look at. Um, he has published in, in media studies in topics ranging from feminism to the end of apartheid in South Africa to Black Lives Matter to pedagogy, African cinema, democracy, service, and even global citizenship, which he'll talk about a little tonight. Um, he's won numerous awards for his scholarship, for his community-based learning initiatives, and for his teaching. Ron has been critical to the development of a number of international studies programs, some of which he's going to talk about tonight, including the Global Scholars Program, which is designed to increase access to international education opportunities for first-generation students and students of color. He has also helped to develop the Pedagogies of Reciprocity Project and the Collaborative Online International Learning, or COIL, at UW. And he told me he's not going to talk a lot about that, but it, you might want to ask questions because it's a way for 
students in the U.S. to connect with students uh, internationally through technology, and there's some really interesting things that are happening in that. And all of this demonstrates his really deep commitment to providing access to the rewards of global education for underrepresented students and for really making them central to, to what he does and to what universities are doing. So tonight he's going to address us on the theme of universal design, radical reciprocity, and global citizenship. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Ron Craig. Uh, thank you all. Um, thanks so much for that very kind introduction. Um, I'm so very honored and humbled and excited about this opportunity to um, talk about the future of SST, uh, think through these issues. Uh, SST was an incredibly uh, foundational experience in my own life, um, has shaped much of what I've done in the future, and so it's exciting to be here and hear all the ideas. I especially want to thank Jan Bender Shetler for all her work organizing these proceedings. Um, it's been an amazing 24 hours. I also want to thank Elaine Meyer Lee for her wonderful uh, opening plenary last night. Um, all the presenters today for their insights and contributions. And I think and I hope that what I'll be saying today really um, sort of resonates and amplifies a lot of what we've already heard today. Um, so I want to begin, as Elaine did, by acknowledging that we're gathered today on the unceded ancestral lands of the Anishinaabe people, who were called the Potawatomi by colonial settlers. Acknowledgements like this have become really commonplace in the Pacific Northwest, where I'm from, uh, but I hesitated to do this today because there's a way in which these acknowledgements uh, can become almost rote, sort of a pro forma performance um, that almost starts to be more of a superficial acknowledging of indigenous peoples, uh, which ironically absolves us rather than holds us accountable. But I think today, in this setting, it is particularly important to begin with such an acknowledgement. This is because it reminds us that, as Elaine alluded to last night, our world has always been both local and global. The global has always been in our backyard and across the, the oceans, and has always involved groups of people moving both within and across boundaries, and both temporarily and permanently. Now, some of those movements have been voluntary in pursuit of a better life, but some people have been bought and sold um, across, ch across oceans and chains of bondage. Some of those movements have been forced, like the death march of the Anishinaabe from this area to first Kansas and then to Oklahoma. And perhaps the greatest numbers of people have moved in that gray area between choice and necessity, driven by violence, poverty, discrimination, or other forces to move. And yes, some have crossed borders to study and to serve and to learn about our wider world. So I mark this to remind us that intercultural encounters are not in and of themselves always intrinsically positive. Intercultural encounters are only positive if we pay attention to the power dynamics at play, and we make sure that those encounters are based in equity and reciprocity. Um, these themes of power, equity, and re reciprocity are ones that I want to keep front and center in my comments today, not least because, in my reading at least, the early visionaries of SST uh, were thinking through these issues in really profound ways, far ahead of their time. And I think these ideas are going to continue to shape SST moving forward. So in offering these thoughts, I come as a fellow traveler. Um, it should go without saying that I'm not someone who has solved these problems, uh, but that I'm working through them alongside the good people here and elsewhere. Likewise, I'm going to scatter examples from my own campus uh, throughout the talk tonight, uh, but not because they're models that Goshen College should fo follow. Rather, they're just um, examples of things that we've tried to do, and hopefully they can sort of uh, spark some inspiration about other ways that would make sense in the Goshen College specific um, context. So I see this as the start of a conversation. And to the extent that I do make provocations, I hope that those are intended uh, as intended to start that conversation rather than to pick a fight. So just a quick note about the context in which I am working. Uh, Utah Bothell is in some ways similar to and in some ways quite different than Goshen. The differences are immediately obvious. UW Bothell is 6,000 students. It's the fourth fastest growing campus in the United States, and it's a state school. Our student body is majority minority, majority first generation, and the most diverse campus in the state of Washington. We have a large number of veterans, and we're located in the Seattle metropolitan area. But there are similarities, too. I teach in the School of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences, which is always seen as its mission, providing a liberal arts education to students who wouldn't otherwise have access to such an education. We serve a very large number of students who commute, 
And we serve a large number of students who are undocumented. And we are striving every day to do that more effectively. Finally, while we may not have the intimacy of Goshen College, we in many ways serve a similar purpose when compared to our sister campus, UW-Seattle, with its more than 45,000 students. Um, so just a quick note on um, some of the images uh, you'll be seeing um, as we move forward. So most of them are lifted from study abroad programs that I've led in South Africa, Tanzania, and Spain, as well as a few more specific images related to what I'll be talking about. But in most cases, they aren't, they aren't intended to correspond directly with the substance of what I'm saying at that moment. Uh, rather, to remind us that everything we're talking about involves real people, individuals, directly impacted by the choices we make. Um, so you'll see lots of cameras and film equipment in these, and I'll talk about why that is later. Um, so I offer my comments today in three acts, with a prelude and an epilogue because after all, we are in the Umbel Center, and I did start out at Goshen as a theater major, and Roy Umbel was my mentor, uh, so it just seems appropriate. Um, now I think I may be out of order here, yeah. Um, so for the prelude, I want to just quickly give an appreciation for SST's innovation at its, at its inception. Um, in Act 1, um, and here you'll notice that I'm flipping the order of these concepts from my title, in Act 1, I want to provide a critique of the concept of global citizenship. Acts two and three then will suggest some possible tools for moving through this critique to generate new directions in global education. In act two, I wanna suggest that universal design might be a useful frame within which to revise and strengthen SST, while act three will return to the concept of radical reciprocity as one which might center an interrogation of power and accountability in how we shape our programs moving forward. So prelude, the innovation of SST. Um, I had hoped to give a longer analysis of what made SST so revolutionary at its inception, but so much has been said over the past 24 hours that I just can't begin to do it justice. So suffice to say for now that while our perspectives have shifted over the last 50 years, and it is true that the field has caught up with SST in some significant ways, nothing should take away from an, an appreciation and celebration of the ultimately visionary approach of SST. While I use different language as a critical cultural media studies scholar 50 years later um, than maybe the language that the founders might have used, I see in that vision a fundamental concern with questions of inequity and difference in power and, pri and privilege across personal, local, and transnational scales. And yes, this photo should count as proof. Oh, I'm bumping, sorry. I must be accidentally hitting it, sorry. Um, so uh, this photo should count as proof that I really did participate in China SST in 1987, uh, and I'll have to beg forgiveness for the horrible mustache later. So Act One, Global Citizenship. Like many other institutions of higher education, Goshen has chosen to highlight the concept of global citizenship as a core value. This goal of producing global citizens has become very widespread, even a truism in higher education, but the particular construction of this concept is relatively new. As Elaine shared with us last night, the history and statistics around study abroad, how many students participate, where they go, and what they do, have changed significantly since the start of SST 50 years ago. I'm not gonna repeat that information here, but I wanna say that one consequence of those shifts is a much more widespread expectation that some form of international education be a part of many students' experiences in college. I also wanna say that those experiences are often expected to take place in quote unquote exotic locations, um, and that they should include some form of quote unquote helping the local population. And I think here we see the shadow side of the SST formulation. In some ways it's actually the price of SST's success in the larger national conversation. Um, so what SST saw as a focus on unequal global economic and political power becomes a focus on the exotic. And SST's focus on meaningful service becomes a sentimental desire to assuage discomfort over those very inequalities. Now when I lead my own SST, or sorry, not my SST programs, my study abroad programs, we didn't actually steal the acronym from Goshen. Um, when I lead these programs, I see this in a disturbing tendency for students and faculty alike to expect the host community to simply open up for them for their own benefit. It's as if the primary role of a host community is not to go about its daily life, but rather to make itself available and transparent for our learning, for our entertainment, and for our own transformation to a, becoming a global citizen. And I'll say that I've experienced this in a much more extreme way in programs that I've led to the Global South, in South Africa and Tanzania. 
than I have taken students to Spain, for example. I believe this stems directly from the power of these discourses in global citizenship. These expectations that my good intentions will be immediately recognized, that I'll be welcomed with open arms into whatever community I might choose to enter. And if that community remains somewhat opaque to me, then my program leaders, or maybe my host family, or perhaps the country itself is not doing its job correctly. Now, I'm of course overstating the language here. But the desire for a big, emotional, transformative experience that comes through interactions with the other, however that other might be understood, is a driving force for this particularly American form of sentimentalism, uh, as identified by writer Teju Cole, among others. And I think it is incumbent upon us as educators to consider at whose expense that big transformative experience might be occurring. We also see this in how students um, and how students who carry different identities into study abroad actually experience different locations. I've seen white students become jealous of black students who were welcomed more warmly into a South African community. I keep jumping ahead and I'm not quite sure why. I apologize for that. Let me see. Yeah, I'm actually way ahead. Maybe if I don't touch that. <laughs> see if that makes a difference. Um, so, uh, sorry, uh, back to my spot. So. Um, I've seen white students become jealous of black students who were welcomed more warmly into a South African community than they themselves were. And I've seen Muslim students who wear the hijab discriminated against in rural Spain. The excellent research that was conducted by Jose Ortiz and Landon Weldy on the experiences of Latinx students in SST, I jumped again, didn't it? I'm not quite sure what to do here. Um, uh, the excellent research that was conducted on Latinx students and their experiences in SST um, both highlights some of these complicated experiences, both between study abroad programs and their host communities and within the groups themselves in really insightful ways. And what we see across these situations is that all the parties involved arrive into these relationships, not as blank slates, but with all of our pre-existing privileges, assumptions, and, and prejudices. Again, this demands of us as educators an explicit engagement with questions of identity, power, and privilege. And we need to do this not as an afterthought, once a crisis has arrived, or as an addendum to our programs, but at the very outset, as a fundamental core question of any international education program. So a further critique of global citizenship practices is that they often assume that awareness of global problems is a sufficient goal in itself. But as a sociologist might put it, awareness is a nece necessary but not sufficient condition for social change. Indeed, the ideal of global citizenship often prioritizes the awareness raising and good intentions of some US-based students over the impact of those practices on others, particularly those living and working in the communities that host us. This is an especially easy trap for, ed for educators to fall into because, of course, our students are our first point of contact and our first responsibility. But we need to also be willing to think beyond our students if we want to consider the full impact of our programs. Um, so I'm realizing this must be on a timer because uh, it's moving on its own. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually black it out at certain moments. Um, I think that might make more sense. Um, I do want to pull up this slide, though. Uh, because it does uh, point directly to um, the fact that I've argued elsewhere that this dynamic actually replicates the dual nature of colonial and post-colonial government that scholar Mahmoud Mamdani outlined in his influential book, Citizen and Subject, but extends it to a global scale. Um, so what this, art this article is arguing is that U.S.-based students become global citizens while residents of the global south become subjects of a global world order in which they are seen as lacking agency. So this, I believe, is the double-edged danger we face with global citizenship. And now I'm going to just black it out so it doesn't keep switching. Um, in the vast majority of times that I hear it phrased, um, uh, invoked in almost any institutional setting, it contains two contradictory impulses. On the one hand, there is an idealistic impulse toward a world with universal human rights, citizenship for all that isn't limited by national boundaries, and a type of globalized democratic order among equals. Yet almost always accompanying this discourse is another one, one of what James Clifford described as the individual possessiveness of Western culture that sees the participation of those of us based in the United States as one of competition and a, glo and a global citizen as a more efficient and effective competitor 
within an, within an exploitative model of global capital. This vision expands the model of US citizenship, exclusive, privileged, leading, generating wealth, as expanding not the limits of who is a citizen, but rather the physical boundaries of where the disproportionate power of US citizens might travel. Now, this is an admittedly polemic critique of the discourse of global citizenship, um, and I'm not yet willing to throw the term out with the bathwater, uh, though I'll also admit that I'm pretty close. And the problematic nature of the pairing of the term global with the term citizenship for undocumented students and their families, I think should go without saying. But I also want to add that Goshen's elaboration on the concept, as it's been articulated in the core values, and also as it's being further elaborated through the process of the search conference and the workshop this afternoon, is undoubtedly among the most progressive versions I've seen while doing this research. Even so, I do want to warn against the overwhelming power of these more mainstream discourses around global citizenship, especially in higher education today, and the challenges of overcoming them. Okay, act two, universal design. Whether we continue to utilize the discourse of global citizenship is not my primary concern. Discourses will of course always ebb and flow, and what we do with those discursive turns matter. I wanna propose as a way of thinking through some of these questions in the last 24 hours that the concept of universal design may be useful. Universal design originates from within the disability rights movement and finds its strongest expression in the fields of architecture and environmental design. Universal design has also given birth to a related field in critical pedagogy known as universal design and learning. Both have sets of principles that they follow and we can talk about these in more detail. But what I'm most interested in today are the more overarching logics of the, of the concepts. So universal design makes one basic assumption that designing environments or tools that can be utilized by everyone regardless of physical or other ability will be better for everyone this is not only different from, but directly counter to the logics of accommodation and accessibility. The latter logic seeks to leave existing practices in place to the greatest degree possible, making concessions where necessary to increase accessibility and accommodate those who, for whatever reason, don't fit into our existing model. Universal design instead says that the designs that are universal, or as universal as possible, will work better be designed more elegantly, and create the most collective improvement in the, in the quality of life for everyone. In other words, architecture or learning designed with disabilities in mind improves the living and learning of able-bodied people as well. So as we reimagine the structure of SST and extend universal design to include other categories of difference and inclusion, this fundamental assumption could significantly reshape both what SST looks like and how it's talked about. Now let me clarify, I'm not an expert in universal design by any extent of the imagination, but I do think that these concepts can be uh, really helpful in helping us rethink uh, how we approach global education. So to that end, here are three clarifying points. So first, a universal design mindset sees the frustrations, challenges, and complaints of those left out of the mainstream design as a roadmap to improvement for all students rather than as an obstacle to be overcome and to fit those students into the mainstream model. This point leads us to respond quite differently to the obstacles to participation in SST that are named by students and others. Athletic schedules, family resistance, undocumented status, relative cost, to name just a few I've heard over the past 24 hours. Instead of taking those challenges as, as outliers to be resolved and eliminated one by one, Universal design centers those concerns and takes them as invitations to improve the entire program, including for those already able to participate in SST. So let me offer one small example from the University of Washington. So at UW, we became aware, uh, particularly for our summer programs, that there was a misalignment in the timing between scholarships and program commitments, which meant that students would be accepted to programs and have to commit to paying the full program fee before they knew if they would receive any scholarships or financial aid. This had a disproportionate impact on our students at Bothell, first generation students of color, and it also created an incentive for both the study abroad office and for program directors to focus on students who would be easier to recruit. In other words, students who didn't have to worry about being able to sign the contract if they were accepted. So the solution was a relatively simple one, but surprisingly difficult to shepherd through the bureaucracy of the university. 
We made the applications for programs and scholarships a single application with a single deadline, meaning students would learn of their scholarship awards at the same time they learned if they had been accepted into a program. Simple and elegant, yes? So our next move is to generate a backstop of funds for students relying on federal student loans, which is also misaligned in terms of timing. So that if we're confident that a student will receive further loans, but they haven't received that confirmation from the federal government yet, we will actually guarantee those loans in the unlikely case that they don't come through. Um, these innovations are relatively simple and benefit all students with a streamlined application, scholarship, and acceptance system, but it solved a major obstacle in gaining access for study abroad students um, with limited means. A uh, second point of clarification. Universal design is not one size fits all. As those of us who don't fit hats or gloves that claim to be one size fits all, you already know this, right? The goal of universal design is not uniformity across all forms of distant, difference, but rather equity. That is a terribly important point. So for instance, it is clear in the discussions that have been going, ongoing that SST Alt has not achieved its goals and has been perceived as a second class version of SST, following a logic of accommodation rather than full inclusion. So the impulse to replace both SST and SST Alt with a single more expansive program that it can address the needs of all Goshen College students, including those who are commuter, commuters, who are undocumented, who are first generation, those who have family commitments, those who are student athletes. This is an impulse toward universal design. In other words, the goal of universal design is not to ignore or erase difference, but rather to center it in a way that ensures all needs are met in an equitable fashion. So again, let me offer an example from UW Bothell. This year, we have initiated a new program called UW Bothell Global Scholars. This is the one that Jan had just mentioned. It grows out of our experiences as program le leaders and addresses three ongoing issues for us in making our international programs more inclusive. First, our first generation students and students of color often face significantly more financial constraints to participating than do our other students, along with other factors like a lack of family support or family concerns around travel and safety. Second, our undocumented students were completely overlooked in imagining how they might gain access to internationally oriented experiences. This was particularly true following the Trump administration's rescission of what was called advanced parole, which allowed DACA recipients to participate in study abroad programs. Third, when marginalized students were able to participate, they often encountered programs that were ill-prepared to think critically about the specific challenges they faced as marginalized students. I'm sure this set of challenges sounds very familiar to many of you in this room. So in response, we created UW Bothell Global Scholars to address these problems simultaneously. It's a year-long program with selection of the cohort in the fall, followed by workshops in the winter on how to apply for both different kinds of programs and also internships, both domestically and internationally, along with scholarships and financial aid. Membership in the cohort also comes with a guarantee of some scholarship funds. In the spring then, cohort members will be enrolled in a three credit course that both prepares them for their experiences and encourages them to think critically and creatively about those experiences. Following participation in a summer experience, and that can either be a study abroad program or an internship, either internationally or domestically, um, students will return in the fall and enroll in a five credit course, in, which will really delve deeply into the questions of power, privilege, equity, and difference that we've been discussing here. So our first cohort of 22 uh, includes students from all five schools within UW Bothell, 20 students of color, several undocumented students, and our entirely first generation. And here I'm actually, oh, that's interesting. When I blank it, it actually stops. <laughs> um, and there they are. So that's our first cohort of the UW Bothell uh, Global Scholars. So the Global Scholar Program tries to combine wraparound academic and financial support services with the critical intellectual components that students have been craving. And as I said, we are still in our first year of the program, but we have hopes that the Global Scholars Program will become a significant force for increasing both access to and constructive critique of international education on our campus. Um, finally, let me offer a third uh, clarifying point regarding universal design. No single design will ever fully achieve the goals of universal design. So a pragmatic approach doesn't allow the perfect to become the enemy of the good. Another way of stating this point is that the goal of universal design is generative and productive. While critique is essential, the lack of perfection should not limit us from attempting shifts in a positive direction. 
So, Act Three, uh, Radical Reciprocity. So in this act, I want to offer radical reciprocity as a concept that I've been developing to frame more equitable pro programs. On one level, what radical reciprocity is might be self-evident, taking the concept of reciprocity very seriously and centering its core value of global education. So why the radical? The reason radical is necessary as an adjective is because reciprocity, not unlike global citizenship, has become a catchword for many international education programs. Every program claims to be concerned with recipro reciprocity, some claim to achieve it, and, and yet few take it seriously or take it as far as it needs to go. In one sense, we might think of radical reciprocity as universal design applied to global citizenship. What would it look like to take that double-edged sword of global citizenship and abandon its superficial invocations in favor of a deep engagement with the substantive, material, political, and philosophical meanings of citizenship? and equal universal citizenship on a global scale. What might that look like? Another way of putting this would be, how do we take away one edge of that double-edged sword, the edge that is designed to, sh to train the shock troops of new world order that centers even more exclusively on the perspectives and resources of the global north? If we took that edge away and left only the Goshen College version of global citizenship, what might that look like? For starters, such a process would have to center, in all its programs, questions of difference in equity and how to redress those inequalities. The status quo would not and could not hold under a process that takes seriously a radically reciprocal relationship between students and faculty, between sending and host institutions, and host families, host communities, and marginalized communities within each of these groups. Such a process might also deprive its students of the self-satisfied big emotional experience of an exotic adventure in helping others. What it would favor instead would be a relentlessly self-reflexive engagement with the realities of global inequality, the politics of that inequality, and our varying individual and collective responsibilities within them. Such a process might also require more creative financial arrangements for institutions to enact and that it would take seriously the inequities between groups of students within an institution, as well as the inequities between our home institutions and the groups in which we, with which we, we interact abroad. For instance, if we reallocated resources to host communities or to support undocumented students with internationally facing immersive experiences, rather than assuming that the, the privilege of travel must always be in a single direction and that a national boundary must be crossed. While this may seem pie in the sky, Returning to my earlier point, the pursuit of radical reciprocity will always still be working within the constraints of our institutional settings and the resources they provide. Again, let's not let the perfect become the enemy of the good. Now, while I don't have time to detail many of our attempts in this uh, particular direction, um, in part because they often involve a lot more context to make sense, let me just name two that I would be happy to talk about in more detail if others are interested, and then give just a bit more detail on the third. So one example involves media projects, um, and that's why there were cameras in the images that you either would have seen or might have seen or saw be beginnings of and endings of. Um, so that project uh, took uh, teams of study abroad students uh, who would then pair with local undergraduates and with local media activists to produce short films. Uh, in one instance, for example, uh, these, these films focused on the impact of local communities on the hosting of the World Cup in South Africa in 2010. The second example is the one that Jan mentioned just briefly, which involves using online technologies to create teams of students from different locations around the world. Uh, in one case, for instance, I have students in UW, uh, South Africa, and Palestine who are working together on assignments for a defined amount of time uh, during the quarter. What distinguishes both these programs is that UW students interacted with others around the world as co-creators in a much more equal relationship than we often find in, tra in traditional study abroad. A third example of attempting to implement radical reciprocity is another very different project we've enacted called Pedagogies of Reciprocity. This project seeks to center the experiences of our partner practitioners in the host countries uh, for our global programs by forming a research cluster together with faculty thinking critically about these programs. This May, we will be bringing folks together in Seattle to form a research agenda and to design a set of best practices for such partnerships. And in the following years, we hope to continue the research cluster's work 
by gathering at each of the partners' institutions and locations in the Global South. So that, for example, the radical queer activist in India can visit the Pastoral Women's Council in Tanzania, along with our study abroad program there. By elevating the perspectives of, the, of those on the front lines of our international programs and developing stronger South-South collaborations, we hope to decenter the role of institutions in the Global North and develop more reciprocal relationships across the board. Um, zip ahead to the title here. So the epilogue, my whole life is an SST. So in conclusion, I wanna highlight a comment that surfaced in the search conference report. When someone said, quote, my whole life is an SST. This comment is such a profound gift. It both challenges and summarizes so many of our past assumptions about SST and provides a roadmap for what is great about SST and also what must change. At several points in the search conference report, what came through is a strong desire to define the it that makes SST what it is. What makes it so important, so valuable, so powerful? And how does one communicate that to potential students, their families, faculty leaders, host families, and the many other stakeholders in the SST program? At several points, intercultural exchange or intercultural immersion seemed to come to the fore as a possible answer to that question. But for someone who is already immersed in two cultures, say between the culture of their family of origin or their home neighborhood and the dominant culture of the United States, for someone who is already constantly having to code switch, this can't be the totality of what makes SST important and worthwhile. As the comment says, their whole life is already an SST. And this is a question of inclusion across difference. So to circle back to my earlier remark, intercultural exchange or intercultural immersion, like global awareness, may be a necessary but is not a sufficient condition with which to make the magic of SST occur. I wanna argue that a key catalyst to making intercultural immersion effective for the kinds of results SST seeks to realize is the centering of questions of equity, difference, and power. As the student body of Goshen becomes more diverse, and as some of the existing forms of SST become less unique vis-a-vis -vis other schools, a deep commitment to thinking about inequities locally and globally, at home and abroad, interpersonally and internationally, could become a central defining feature of what gives SST its magic. My hope is that universal design and radical reciprocity can become touchstones that help in some small way as Goshen navigates the future directions of SST, keeping at the fore its original questions of equity, difference, power, and privilege on a global scale. If that's what Goshen College means by global citizenship, then I'm all for it. I very much look forward to your questions and to continuing the conversation both tonight and into the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, I believe there are some microphones. Uh, so if you're interested in a question, please raise your hand. I'd love to hear what people think, comments or questions. <laughs> I'm, wonder, I'm wondering if you're aware of or might just think for a minute what a study program in another country designed specifically by diverse people for diverse community might look like. Yeah, great question. Um, so uh, I think these are becoming more and more common. Um, they're often, so for instance, at University of Washington, uh, we have several that are um, run by our GoMap office, which is the office that focuses on um, uh, particularly graduate students, but also undergraduates. Um, and oftentimes, they, I think there are a couple uh, dynamics. One is that they make sure that uh, the leaders are trained in uh, how to address questions of difference and equity in study abroad. We heard in the, the fantastic panel that you led um, this afternoon uh, that the leader being a person of color isn't a guarantee of the leader being prepared to handle the issues that students of color face. Um, it certainly is, is fantastic if it can happen. Um, and certainly we need, in the profession, we need far more folks who lead study abroad programs who are people of color, first generation, and identify in other ways that are marginalized. Um, because it makes a huge difference for students, of course, to see someone who looks like them in those roles. Um, at the same time, we still need the training, uh, regardless of who that person is. Um, and then oftentimes, it is a centering of those questions through the program. 
Um, what does it mean? So, uh, for instance, one program that some colleagues lead uh, from UW Bothell looks at um, black exile in Paris um, and looks at both the long histories of black exile in Paris, but also the more recent histories of black exile in Paris. Um, and and it, that also raises another interesting question, which is um, the, the, there, was a, there was a comment that I loved in the search conference report uh, that sort of took a dig at the, the program that goes and studies in a castle in Europe, right? And that makes total sense to me, right? I totally am completely bought in to the commitment that SST has to going to places that don't have that kind of power. It's also very interesting for me because I actually teach in a castle in Europe, in Spain, uh, with this politics of soccer course that I take. And for students who are coming from nations that have been colonized by Spain, that's a different experience than a student who identifies as white, has had a lot of privilege, and then shows up at a castle in Spain. It's a very different question that it opens up. Um, so I think we want to keep all of those options open. But I do think it's a matter of not only uh, recruiting and making the experience possible, but also making sure that people are ready to talk about the issues that arise as they do. Thank you. Other questions? My friends who I graduated from Goshen threatened to uh, actually live tweet questions and asked if I'd take questions from Twitter, but I really don't want to go to them, so. <laughs> Ron, it's, it's scary to ask questions because it might show our own ignorance of what we're talking about. But I'm wondering, out of our experience, we were in China. How do you help host families not to adapt to the, prejudice, to the preconceptions they have of what American students will expect mm -hmm. so we can participate in that learning experience? What does the family learn or put into the learning experience? For stay? Yep, absolutely. It's a fantastic question. It also came up in the panel this afternoon uh, that Richard led. Um, and what the students were saying was that it would be very, very helpful, even if, even on a sort of a basic level, if host families were just made aware that, not, that their students aren't necessarily going to look like what they think of as an American student from television or from other sources, right? That uh, the United States is more diverse than it's often portrayed. And so um, to sort of prepare them for multiple forms of diversity. Um, I, think that, I, I think that training of host families, training of host communities is always important. I also think that we're never going to be able to train them in all the nuances of what it means to talk about race in the United States. The reality is our racialized histories, our racialized politics in the United States are incredibly bizarre and, and, and um, complex in many ways. And so I don't think we can expect folks in our host communities to understand all those nuances, but I think we can do some training to prepare them for, um, for the students that might be arriving so that the students don't have to do that educating themselves. Um, one of the, the sort of basic premises of of thinking about diversity and inclusion is that the students who are marginalized shouldn't have to always be the ones doing the educating about their marginalization. So to the extent that we can take that burden off by, by training host families in advance or by training the directors of the programs to know how to handle it if something does come up with a host family, um, I think that's a great benefit. And let me just say, like the fear of ignorance. Um, I, I re recently saw this video, I'm sure many of you have seen it by a fellow named Jay Smooth, who's a hip hop uh, vlogger. He has this, something called Ill Doctrine and he also did a recent TED talk. Uh, but he talked about moving from the, um, now I'm gonna blank on it, what the first version was. Like basically saying, we tend to think of working on race as like you've either done it or you haven't. You've sort of accomplished it and you're done. And he was saying we need to think about it as the dental hygiene model of thinking about race, that you always need to be working on it and you always need to be thinking about it. It's not a question of you have it or not. It's a question, of, you know, if someone says, did you brush your teeth this morning? You don't say, but I'm a clean person. I don't need to brush my teeth. And his argument is like, it's something that you need to constantly do and be involved in. Oh, start here. Uh, so, as I'm finishing my time in Goshen as a student, 
I'm realizing that change doesn't happen all of a sudden. So can you talk a little bit about time frame of implementing such a huge design for such a big issue? Yeah. So. Yeah, no, no I, I appreciate that immensely, and you're absolutely right. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, I think, I, th I think it's a, it, it's a um, I would almost describe it as a paradox, because I think the problem is, I, I'm thinking of uh, the piece by Robin Kelly uh, after, um, after Ferguson, where he said, why we won't wait. That was the title of it, right? And I think it's uh, too easy for people in positions of privilege to say, this is going to take some time. Give us time, right? And so there's an urgency to it, and we need to recognize that urgency and engage with it. We also need to recognize that institutions are institutions, and institutions will do what institutions do. <laughs> and that's not move, turn on a dime, right? And there are some good reasons for that. And so I think um, in thinking about how to make change, we want to both be urgent about making the changes that we can and be patient about making the changes that we know are gonna take more time. For instance, funding is, gonna, is not something that's gonna happen overnight. Redoing SST Alt is not something that's going to happen overnight. And I'm incredibly impressed by the work that's been done to imagine the different permutations of what that could look like. Um, but it, that will take time. Um, I don't, it's not a great answer to your question, but I, I appreciate the spirit of it for sure. There was one, yeah. And so my question is, considering the fact that the student, most of the students are sent for their SST programs to most of the parts to most parts of the world, maybe especially third world developing countries, so which we, and so the different developing countries has got less resources compared to the U.S. And so, how do the students get be prepared to adjust to the areas? Yeah. Um, so, just to make sure I'm understanding the question, so you mean how do the students who are going be prepared to sort of deal with? what they'll encounter, is that what you're asking? Yeah, because most of the countries they go to have got less resources compared to the US. Yeah, absolutely. So um, again, I think, I think that's one of those things that we can talk about training, and I think the preparation is important. I think pre-departure work is incredibly essential um, to getting people ready to experience something that they haven't before. I think what many folks who have gone also say is you, you don't know what it's like until you've been there. Um, so uh, I also think we actually under, uh, we pay too little attention to what happens when students return um, and thinking about how do you make sense of what that experience was. In some ways, the experience itself is often sort of managed and functions well and people come back with good, good memories, but what, how you make sense of that is really crucial. And I think that's particularly important for the goals of SST, which is to think about global inequities and to think about the way um, our world operates. Um, the simple fact of going somewhere that has less resources, you can come away from that and just say, whew, thank God, thank God that's not me, and continue to live your life in exactly the same way. So the question of how do you process that experience and then uh, make sense of it becomes really crucial. I also think it's absolutely essential that anytime people are going to a place that has less resources, that the program reflect back on the folks who have less resources at home as well that those be held together as a both and. Um, so often it's sort of uh, seen as a like, well, which side is worse off, right? And I think, um, so for an example, um, when I've taken trips to South Africa, um, what I'll do is in the pre-departure work, we'll read all sorts of South, Africa, South African liberation literature. Um, we'll read Mandela, we'll read Biko, we'll read Mamfela Remfeli. Um, but when we're in South Africa, we're actually reading liberation texts from the United States. Diary of Malcolm X, those sorts of things. And so what that does is it helps people keep both of those sides, the, both of those frames in mind, that yes, I'm experiencing a certain kind of inequity here and that it's extreme, but it doesn't mean, oh, thank God, it's not like that. All the problems are here, everything good is back home, but you're think, keeping both of those in the frame at the same time. Uh, Mike's coming, I think. Yeah. <laughs> coming. Oh, it's Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> my remarks do not have an axe to grind, <laughs> just something that's going through my head, and I think it might be helpful if you commented on it. 
And that is, can you overload your international studies or your intercultural program just with too many goals, just far too many goals? You're going to work in every uh, problem there is in uh, culture, com cultural communication. And where do you then decide this is what I'm going to, we're going to try to do and do it well. And there are some things that uh, uh, will have to be taken care of in another way. Does that go through, is that an issue in your work? <laughs> and what do you do about it? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. And, and I think there's always going to be pedagogical questions, right? Um, anytime you're trying to structure a program, a classroom, anything, you're always sort of saying, what can I leave in? What can I keep? What, can, what do I have to leave out? Um, and that's always a hard choice because as at least I'll speak for myself, I always want to do everything, right? I always want to do 50 things. Um, oftentimes near the end of the term, I realize, okay, I'm actually not going to get there and I finally relax because <laughs> I realize I can't cover everything I wanted to. What I would say, though, is that I think thinking about questions of equity and difference need to be centered, and in some ways this would bring me back to universal design, is that if we center those questions first, those questions will come up, right? Those questions are there, whether you surface them or not. So to surface them explicitly from the beginning um, means that you're able to work with them and, and process them and hopefully have some good outcomes. Um, if you if, if you sort of don't deal with it, hope it goes away, it means those conversations are going to happen, those experiences are going to happen, you're just not going to know it. And it's going to happen particularly on the backs of people who are relatively marginalized, right? They're the ones who are going to have the, the, the most difficult experiences with it, and so they'll be left on their own to deal with it. So that's why I would argue that this really needs to be front and center, um, even recognizing that it does mean that something else will get bumped, right? There are other things you can't do because of it. Thanks, good question, yeah. As an international student here, I think that international students can help greatly improve and enhance the programs, the global education program in their college campuses. So my question is, how do you see international students in University of Washington campus or Goshen College campus contributing to improve an SST or the global education program? Yeah, fantastic question, and, and um, exactly what you're saying. I think, I think as much as they can be included in all of these processes, right? Um, it's a huge mistake to sort of say, oh, because they're studying internationally, they have nothing to add, right? Um, and so that looks different ways. One of the, one of the great ironies of University of Washington's system, um, and it's a little hard to describe quickly, but I'll try. Uh, basically, when you study abroad, you don't pay tuition, you pay the program fee. Um, and so, and it's a way of encouraging students to do it. And I won't go into all the details of that, but one of the things it does do is it means for international students, it's often cheaper to study abroad than to study on campus because you're paying the program fee, not the tuition for out of state or international students. Um, so we actually have a lot of international students who do study abroad. Um, and I think thinking of ways to make those, those possibilities is really crucial. But then I also think it's important to have them in the conversations about search conferences, in the, in the conversations about if we're gonna have a domestic SST, what does that look like? What would, what would you find valuable? How would you make sense of that? And then also in this question of sort of thinking about um, uh, making sure the, the uh, mirror is probably the wrong metaphor, <laughs> making sure the mirror works both ways. I think international students obviously have a particular contribution to make in thinking about how the study abroad experience reflects back onto the US and the inequities in the US and marginalization in the US. Thanks. Other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks. Let, let me just say quickly, I really am very serious about seeing this as a continuation of a conversation. So um, please do feel free to contact me. Um, I'm happy to talk about all of this stuff more. So thank you. OK. Um, we're going to pivot a little bit here. Um, thanks so much, Ron, for that wonderful talk and challenge. And we like um, you know, some good challenges here. 
The, the next person who's going to talk to us is uh, Earl Kellogg, and he was introduced at length on the first night, but if you'll remember, he uh, spent a long career at the University of Illinois um, in the um, School of Agriculture, but in international affairs, and has worked as a higher education consultant, has a long, long time in this field. And so we asked him if he would come and be our listener and just observe what was going on during this conference, and then at the end, <laughs> to come and give us some insight, give us some, I think he hasn't really been at Goshen before, maybe before this, and so he's very new, like our other speakers um, have a deep connection to Goshen, and so this is like a bit of uh, someone who is from the Mennonite church, and yet a bit of an outsider, and tell us what he heard, and uh, so we'll welcome him. I think I'm going to put this aside. It might take off on me again. <laughs> uh, and I will take your papers here, Ron, so that I don't start giving you Well, what an inspirational and educational conference uh, that there has been in the last 24 plus hours. Um, I, I think I, I think that, and I think many of you do think that, and I say that as a um, person as a, of a higher education professor and uh, a leader in the higher education institution, and as a member of the Mennonite Church USA Executive Board, and as a consultant that's um, been working in higher education institutions on international affairs for several years, probably been to 50 different institutions in the last uh, 12, 13 years. Uh, so I come with a sense of lenses that are both academic and church and kind of comparative uh, as a consultant. So that's how you should take um, my remarks. First of all, I do want to thank President Becky for asking me to listen deeply and um, then report back. I, I, bought, I um, lobbied for just listening, but she said, no, I have to report back to you. <laughs> and uh, I also want to thank Kathleen Yoder. Um, Kathleen uh, guided me and advised me and introduced me to all kinds of people. And so Kathleen, uh, I really appreciate that. I'm going to talk briefly about some things that I liked about the conference, and then I want to spend some time on themes that I heard and some themes I didn't hear. Um, and hopefully we can do that um, thinking about the future. Uh, I don't want to spend lots of times on all of these because I've been told you have a pretty strict time limit. It is later in the evening, and I know many of you are interested in going home and getting warmed up. Why, what is it I liked when I heard this conference? One of the things that was really inspirational to me was the enthusiasm for SST. Uh, in academic circles, sometimes you don't hear that among faculty and students, and, and that was heartwarming and inspirational for me. And it is one of those items in global affairs in higher education institutions that the public really understands. They get study abroad, SST kinds of activities. Other things we do in international affairs are a little more uh, less understood in the public, so it's an important in that way. I really appreciated the fact that the, there was faculty and student partnership in this conference. Uh, there were joint presentations, there was joint analysis, um, and that was really, I thought, quite helpful. Um, I appreciated the fact that you included the hosts in some of the countries that you've been working on, and that you um, also included students that were underrepresented in many ways, and they did analysis and made uh, presentations from their perspectives as well. Thirdly, I appreciated the fact that the provost and the president were in the conference almost all the time. <laughs> That's not often the case in many universities, but that shows a commitment 
that I think is really important. I'll come back a little bit later to that. I also appreciated the analytical approach that students took. It wasn't just an anecdotes. It was also results of surveys and the kinds of information that they had gathered from each other and organized and, and um, worked on. So that was good. I thought there was a good balance between anecdotes and stories and analysis. And being a professor, I obviously like analysis and data, but there's something very powerful about stories. And I would encourage you to not forget about those stories as you communicate this to potential donors as well as thinking about it among yourselves. Um, and I also appreciated the fact that you are realizing that you were pioneers in this 50 years ago, but that there's many institutions now who are doing much, much of the same kind of thing, and it's time to start thinking about the future. That I appreciated very much. So, um, <clears throat> Let, when I think about this issue and in, in imagine the future, um, it strikes me as I look at the young people in this room and in these sessions that we've had, they're going to be <clears throat> engaged as leaders, employers, employees, citizens in the decade of 2020, 2030, 2040, 2050, 2060, 2070, and 2080. And if you think this world is complicated and tightly wound now, think about 2040 and 2050. So we have a major responsibility in higher education to help students understand that this global future, whatever it may be, and we don't know what it's going to be, but we do know it's going to be an important part of their lives, it's going to be an important part of their uh, jobs, and it's going to be an important part of their citizenship. And that's not only true for students. That's true for university faculty and university staff. And in the consultants that we have done on study abroad and other institutions, sometimes some of the most significant constraints comes from the administrative staff, the people in um, health and safety, or the people that work on financial aid, or the people who do financial transfers abroad, et cetera. So, I would encourage you to think about this holistically in terms of preparing for this global future that we're going to have. And um, it seems to me that you're doing that. So number one theme that I thought about as I heard what you do here and thought about the future is assessment. Um, we talked about that in the early first session as well. Assessment with respect to uh, discipline an academic impact assessment with respect to um, citizenship and behavior and attitudes and assessment with respect to career and job, et cetera. It seems to me Goshen College is really well suited to do some interesting analysis on these kinds of uh, assessments. You have, I suppose, pretty close contact with many of your SST people who've gone years and years before, as well as those who are going now. And that's the notion that you might, that you are in a great position to start talking about with and without SST experience. What difference did that make in terms of your discipline, in terms of your citizenship, and in terms of your career? My sense in the career issue is that it makes a difference for a long time in one's career. It's not just that first job, but it, when you are in a uh, business or you're in some organization and it becomes apparent that they're going to be more globally engaged, then people that have that kind of experience are often uh, tapped for, for that. So I think you could add to a burgeoning literature on this now in a very real way. So I would hope that you could think about not only the question of with and without, but also before and after, that kind of analysis on the um, expectation or on the assessment. The second theme it seems to me is uh, I really like the emphasis you put on going to lower income countries, the non-Western countries, et cetera. 
uh, my career in the economics of agriculture development was in those countries. I wrote my PhD thesis in Africa and spent a lot of time in Africa and Southeast and East and South Asia as well as Latin America. But Europe, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, uh, Russia, all matter too. And so might want to think about how we could enrich the offerings to include some of those places as well. They're going to be a part of the future of this globe in significant ways. Um, but don't, but I, I, I can't hardly hear myself say this because most of the universities I go to, I say almost exactly the opposite. So I appreciate that, that's, uh, that here I can say the other. I think one needs to start thinking about a theme that focuses on a future using other possible education abroad options. Uh, these third party providers aren't the third party providers that your mom and dad were working with in their particular positions. There are some very rich, very wonderful programs that they offer. And so that uh, I hear Goshen talk about wanting to uh, serve more students and maybe engage in more different kinds of programs, uh, I'm not suggesting that you would go completely in that direction at all. But there are some very worthwhile programs in those, and I'd be happy to talk about some of those. And they're, some of them are very creative. Number four, I like the emphasis on the grassroots and the institutions and study abroad site partners that I hear as I've listened to uh, the presentations and the small groups, et cetera. I think if I understand correctly, you have made an emphasis on those kinds of uh, institutions and organizations and people. I would also suggest that you find ways in your study abroad program to at least think about having an engagement with the rich and powerful in these countries. That power spectrum is important, and I, I'm not suggesting that you would engage the rich and powerful in, in ways that would help, would make you think what they do is, is fine, but they are an important actors in this globe, and I would, I would hope that you could find students having a chance to interact with them and understand their perspectives, which are often interesting and uh, sometimes um, a little bizarre, but you need to hear those stories and think about them as well. Um, I think that, um, so a broader sample in the power spectrum might be of interest. Number five, think about developing key global partners for collaboration, not only in study abroad, but in other international affairs, um, because that in terms of other national institutions, but also in terms of U.S. institutions of higher education here in, in the U.S. Um, you have an infrastructure, you have a commitment, you have a process to do this. There are other liberal arts colleges that don't have this. And it seems to me you could make a real contribution by trying to work with some other universities, and it might help your other colleges, it might help deal with some of the financial issues you have as you're thinking about going forward. And um, I, I think you have a great process and a great story to tell. As you think about the future, you might think about the idea of partnerships here in the US as well as abroad. I really appreciated the sensitivity of this kind of white privilege going to help somebody abroad. And as I heard people say, that's really trans morphed into much more accompaniment kind of a concept, which I think is a healthy one, um, much more than otherwise. I, I, would, I would like to see you thinking about um, how are, could you find ways to do study abroad in the US with these institutions you've been working at in these other countries. Um, there may be ways to get resources for doing that kind of thing and having an exchange the much more equal level on that kind of a possibility. Uh, number seven, uh, with all your experience, um, 
can you now focus more clearly on what kinds of learning objectives that you want to design into your study abroad or SST programs? Um, I think that kind of uh, thinking more seriously about that in terms of the academic kind of learning objectives, but the others in terms of citizenship and career, et cetera, are, are also relevant to that uh, concept. Number eight, uh, you didn't, I didn't hear something that I think is important. And that is, I didn't hear about Goshen's board of directors or trustees. Uh, I've been in universities in which the president changed or the provost changed, and this global affairs program really suffered from that. If you don't have a commitment by your governing board to that, that can happen. Now, I doubt it would happen at Goshen, given your history and culture. But I think it's important that your board of uh, governors or your trustees, whatever it's called, uh, make a commitment to SST, to global affairs, to education abroad, and that that be communicated when there's new leadership developing, and that that would be a core value that they would uh, continue to uh, have as uh, new leadership come and go. Um, I, real, I relearned today and last night about how important leadership is to continuing these kinds of programs and enriching them and changing them as, as, as the conditions change. Um, so I'm going to ask the question. I saw the, the panel of people, I think the five men up there who, I don't think anyone was under 70, I mean was under 80 maybe, um, but you think about when they were actually doing what they were talking about, they were in their 30s and 40s. Uh, are you developing your faculty and leadership in the 30s and 40s to do this kind of thinking, to be this kind of creative about the new ideas in SST and in uh, study abroad and international affairs? This kind of leadership development, not only of professors, but of your administrative leadership as well, is very important. So I would hope you would think about that seriously as you are working on this. Number 10. Uh, service learning in, in, in global affairs, I think, is extremely important. Um, when I retired from the University of Illinois, they asked me, what would you like? They wanted to put an endowment in my name, and they said, what would you like us to have this endowment do? And I said, I would like to have this endowment find students underrepresented in terms of race and class and in terms of um, uh, poverty be able to go abroad and not only study, but also have internships and be engaged in uh, service learning. And so I think that's really important. And that, that service learning, I would hope that you would continue to work at it. I, um, I see a lot of opportunity in multinational organizations in that regard. There's more and more uh, NGOs that are becoming extremely important in policy in shaping this global future and the kind of uh, internships that could be engaged with those kinds of organizations as well as global topical institutions that continue to pop up are important. Eleven, uh, think about including program and opportunities for learning how to work across faith traditions. Uh, one of the critical challenges, I think, facing this world is how do we work across faith traditions to make progress on some of the big challenges that we all face. Um, that's not only working across the traditions of Jewish and Muslim faiths, but many others that are out there and involved. And if we can't come to grips with collaborating in productive ways, then we're in more trouble than I hope that we are. And I would encourage you to make that one of the things of, of uh, SST focuses on on some of your programs. It's really important. And so think about faith uh, traditions and how you might be engaged in working together on those. Number 12, uh, public engagement. 
The American public badly needs to better understand global issues and have more respect for people in um, other cultures and other faith traditions. Uh, Goshen College could make a real impact if you would think about public engagement on those kinds of issues. You have not only your alumni, but you have a community here and you have a church relationship in which that could be an important element. And so this notion of public engagement on trying to help the American public get a better handle on these kinds of issues could be an important contribution. And number 13, I guess I didn't realize I ended on 13, Becky. Uh, <laughs> um, I, two sets of institutions are gonna be important in the future of this globe. Um, there will be more than these two, but I know two that will be, and that's higher education institutions and faith institutions. Um, this is a topic we don't talk very much about, how we might work together as higher education institutions with faith institutions in, in this uh, future of our work. Uh, can we be creative enough to develop collaboration that would build a more just, a more sustainable world that God has called us to be engaged in? I think we can. And I think Goshen College could be a leader in all of this. And I would hope we would use our best minds and our efforts seeking divine guidance in doing that job. Thank you very much. Wow. Um, what a couple of days this has been. Um, I want to thank the people who devoted many hours of planning to bring this about. Um, and I'm just going to name a few of them. Um, Jandon Bender Shetler, Tom Myers, Madeline Yoder, um, and many others on the planning committee for the search conference and, and for this, this conference. So really, we all owe you a huge debt of gratitude you know, um, this is history in the making. It really is this 50th anniversary. I was so moved and humbled this morning listening to the founders, um, Arlen and Hank and Dan and, and Mario, talk about that moment. Um, and, you know, they are giants. And they were people just like us. Right? <laughs> Can I say that in front of you, Arlen? So, you know, now it is in our hands. And um, I feel humbled and inspired and informed and challenged. I feel encouraged by uh, the participation and the energy, um, particularly of our, of our students. I feel encouraged by the passing of the baton from Tom to Jan, um, and I want you to know, Jan, that you are not alone. <laughs> and um, that we can make history moving forward as the founders of SST made history 50 years ago. And it is a, um, a great responsibility and creative possibility. Um, and I am eager to see the beginning that unfolds as we end this conference. So let it be ended and let the next 50 years begin. We are going to conclude with the singing of the alma mater. And I couldn't help but as I looked at this and was working with it, uh, to notice in that second verse, as we get to a couple of the last phrases, all our talents marked for service and our hearts beat warm and true, ever lead us onward, upward, ever shall our strength renew. And I really feel as I have observed and been involved in this 
as well that a strength of SST is in the process of being renewed. Let us stand together and sing the alma mater. <laughs>